everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca Boucher. I'm the Senior Director for Brand and Marketing uh, within the University of Communication. And joining me is Greg McKinsey. He's our Assistant Director for the Trademark Licensing Office. And we have Elise Crum, who's our Project Manager for Visual Identity. And before we get started, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. Don't be shy. Put yourself some cookies and whatever. And there's also a sign-in sheet that is going around. Very good. So if you just make sure you put your John Hancock on that before you leave, um, because it helps us keep buying pizza for other departments. So you know how many people actually come. So I'm hoping that this is going to work. Very good. Okay. Um, this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about what is the Rutgers brand, what we're trying to protect, and why we're all here today. We're going to talk about then our various policies. So you'll notice that UCM uh, is in charge of shepherding these policies for the university. And then we are going to talk a little bit about the new ACE program that you might all have heard about. And uh, it's a resource that we recently rolled out. And since you're all a captive audience, I thought what a better uh, time than to give it a plug. So, who are we? What, what does it mean to be Rutgers, and what do we reinforce in our messaging when we talk about the university? So first of all, we always say that we're a leading, comprehensive, public research university. You know, it's a lot, it's a little bit of an alphabet soup, there's a lot of adjectives in there, but they're all chosen very carefully because they do apply to all parts of Rutgers, and those are the adjectives that you'll see sprinkled throughout the messaging you're going to see. Um, you'll see that the healthcare is a very big uh, messaging point that we talk about a lot. Um, first of all, RBHS with the inclusion of the New Jersey Medical School, I don't know, 2013, I think. But then also with our, our large partnership that was announced this past summer with Artibus, this is a key initiative for the university. So our, our threefold mission, whoops, I don't want to do that, there we go making sure everyone's paying attention. Um, research, education, and public service includes the healthcare as well. 29 schools and colleges, so we really have you know a lot going on across the four universities. 150 undergraduate and 400 graduate programs. Um, approximately, depending on how you count, Liz knows uh, some of the debate that went around this, uh, 24, thousand faculty and staff so you know there's a lot of people that touch Rutgers in one way or another and we have a, a, a 300 research center so what is the power of the Rutgers brand why are we here today to talk to you about trying to protect it I would guess uh, about 2006 2016 sorry there was a brand valuation study done to say you know what's it worth what are we trying to protect and it came back at 1.4 billion dollars because, especially in the tri-state area, Rutgers is a household name. That's something that we are trying to keep or add value to. And every time we do things that are, you know, counter to the brand, counter to the visual identity, it's like taking a little chisel and, and chipping away that, that, that market value. And we actually want to see that go up. So part of that power is through our 500,000 plus alumni. Every time we graduate a class, that number goes up. The 70,000 students, you know, that come from the, our reach in 50 states and 150 countries, so really global. Um, we are regularly benchmarked. I get surveys all the time from uh, counterparts in the Big Ten, um, other big giant public universities. You know, what do you guys do? How do you do that? You know, they consider us their counterparts and their peers. That's also part of who our brand is and, and who we're affiliated with. The eighth oldest university, and then. Um, depending on who you are, this part of the brand may or may not be of interest, but the birthplace of college football. <laughs> so, and how do we support this brand? I'm going to give you an example of a campaign that we did starting last April, and it'll continue this year. We're in the process of sort of updating these milestones for, for Rutgers, but it's all about what Rutgers does, produces, gives back as a collective university, and that's how we're engaging with our constituents our donors, our students, our parents, our taxpayers, and that's why we came up with this Rutgers Delivers campaign. This is just some of the examples. Has anyone seen this? I think there's a poster in the hallway that has sort of some of the Rutgers Delivers milestone. There's a website that exists, <coughs> RutgersDelivers.info, that sort of summarizes some of these key milestones and, and metrics for Rutgers. I, um, I've been here about a year and a half, and I 
forgive me if people have heard this story. Elise and Greg tell me all the time, you're going to have to get a new story. But <laughs> um, I've been here about a year and a half, and I, we were in the process of developing the Rutgers Delivers campaign. I was sitting at my dinner table with my husband and a couple other friends from town, and I was talking about this and some of the points that we were putting together, and I said, do you know that Rutgers, at the time, had 69,000 students? So before I tell you what he, my husband said, let me just tell you that I'm an MBA graduate of Rutgers. I live in Metuchen, which is six miles from Old Queens, okay? So I'm like right in that bubble. He says to me, <coughs> he says, Rutgers doesn't have that many students. So, and, the re and then I said to him, do you know what my job is? <laughs> so, so, but the reason I tell you that story is because everyone in this room, we all know how many students, we know we have all these schools and departments and we're doing all this great research, but as soon as you leave this campus or any campus or the office, people don't know. And as many times as you think we've told them through newsletters, through Rutgers Today, through press releases, you have to keep telling. And that's one of the reasons we have these brand initiatives and we have these campaigns, is to keep that Rutgers name and that Rutgers value strong. So uh, I'm not going to read this. This is downloadable on a website that I'm going to share with you. But you know, as you're thinking about any sort of communication, it could be in an RFP. It could be something that you're putting out to a vendor. It could be for a, for a department message. What are the messages that talk about Rutgers as a whole? And so we put together sort of the, van, the brand value proposition and the Rutgers positioning statements. And you'll notice a lot of the, the red vocabulary that I highlighted in our <coughs> previous about leading academic research are all woven in here. And this is available for, for anyone to take and sort of then use parts of it that makes sense for your use. Okay, so diving right into policies. The first policy, as I mentioned, there are six um, communication and marketing related policies that are university-wide policies that UCM is charged with taking care of. These are not policies that we've developed to keep ourselves in business. These are things that the university has seen value in and has charged us with making sure everyone has an understanding of why they're important. So the first one, filming on campus, what is it? It, it governs how folks can come on campus and either take pictures or film and record. This really um, pertains to outside vendors. Uh, news outlets, um, people who are filming documentaries, or let's say there's a vendor who just needs a historic building photo, and they say, oh, Rutgers has some cool things down at Old Queen. Let me go there and set up. So they need to ask permission. Although we do ask if folks are, I mean, you guys take photos, I know Liz has teamed up, to just check in with the community affairs offices, make sure there's not midterms happening or some sort of other big campus event, there's not somebody else in the building taking photos. Just from a coordination point of view, we ask for that. That's less what this policy is about. Um, so anyway, they need to request for all of these types of uses because we want to make sure that there's no strange conflict of interest, that um, you know, it's being used in the vein of our mission, and also, again, as I talked, um, that, that there's no coordination, that you're not trying to film in the chemistry building uh, in the lab during midterms or doing some final project. You know those are the kind of things we're looking for. Trademark licensing, I'm going to turn over to Greg. This is his area of expertise. Thank you very much. Everyone's quiet. They finished eating. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, um, Office of Trademark Licensing. I'm Greg Cambridge. I oversee the Office of Trademark Licensing. And essentially, we oversee how all the trademarks, logos, word marks. Basically, if you look at something and think Rutgers, um, that kind of goes through us for us to look at, make sure everyone's utilizing the brand properly. As Rebecca said, you know. The valuable brand. We want to make sure that we're not diminishing the value. We want to make sure people aren't abusing it. They're not distorting it, and also they're not getting any type of um, their own uh, revenue or increasing their brand without us actually you know, gaining something back. So it's kind of important to us. Um, following the, the filming on campus, a lot of other random uh, intellectual property things go through us as well, or at least we're consulted on. So people utilizing Old Queens, um, that iconic building, the stadium, that building, things of that nature, if they were going to utilize that in a photo and try to sell it, that's something that we would look at in agreement, something that we would kind of make sure 
is this what Rutgers wants? Is this, you know, how do we get um, our value out of it? So following that, uh, the trademark licensing policy essentially kind of provides governance on utilizing those marks and making sure everything is kind of on the up and up. So uh, as I look around, I see you know block R's, I see shields, I, I see a lot of different items that bear um, some type of Rutgers logo, word mark, trademark. Um, do people here order items with those marks? Maybe something else? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So. We have a process, I'm hoping you all know this, um, that the, there is a branded merchandise artwork review form that is on our licensing page, which needs to be filled out prior to departments ordering any type of goods. And going through that form will kind of guide you through the process of knowing that you need to use a license venue. So we don't let, um, we have licensees at the university who we vetted through our licensing agent, IMG Collegiate Licensing. And the reason we do this is to make sure that there is insurance on these items, these items are of quality, and partially, maybe most importantly, there is some um, corporate social responsibility involved, which would be, we want to make sure that Joe's T-shirt shack, um, if they're not a licensee, is not producing our items, because they may be, I don't know, using children to knit shirts in their garage. We don't want that. So sometimes the cheapest vendor is not always the best vendor, and since we vet that for licensing and our marks on there, we want to make sure that we're all doing uh, the right thing to make sure that these marks are used correctly, so these licensees have the correct marks, and that we can be a little bit more sure in how they're producing these items, not to take advantage of, of the employees. Um, so we want to obviously protect the integrity of the marks. Um, Frequently, we'll see marks out there, and you may or may not see them, especially if they're infringement marks, that they're, the R is a little off, or it's orange, or it's a different, you know, in the wrong spot, or they're using it in some type of derogatory way. Um, we spend time, a good deal amount of time, looking out for those infringements, going after them. If you see anything, you know, say something, let us know, by all means. I get a lot of stuff from, you know, alumni, fans, uh, social media will say, what is this? And I'll go, I had no idea this was out there. Send it to me. So this way I can call these people up, I can send them cease and desist notices, we can, if necessary, continue and possibly go to litigation. Uh, if anybody has any questions while I'm going through this, by all means, please just stop. It. Right. So this applies kind of everybody. Um, this includes athletics, it includes our office of the president, uh, our chancellors, everybody included has to kind of go through this process. Why? Because we want to make sure, again, the marks are not being used wrong and correctly. They're not being abused. They're not being produced by non-licensees who might not be producing with the right liability insurance, all the things that I mentioned prior. So we kind of have conversations with everybody. Every kind of department, anybody who's ordering anything will go through and they have to fill out that artwork, um, branded merchandise artwork review form. And they have to get approval. They have to use a licensee. We have to review the artwork and make sure it's correct. Because frequently, and even in some, I don't know, even in our department at, on occasion, somebody might have the wrong artwork. That might be wrong. We may update something. And all of a sudden, somebody who's ordering something doesn't have the right artwork. We want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So when you spend money and you utilize it, you get an item that's going to be reflective of what the current brand is. Yes? Um, so when we order things, are you connected to purchasing in some way so that you see, do you flag those orders? Yes, we're in the process and continue to, they send stuff over to us. Oh, they do. Yeah, absolutely. So they'll send things. Um, so if you miss the form and we, and we order something, somehow it makes its way to your office. There's a couple of different routes that that occurs. Um, one is often someone will find the licensee and they'll think they're doing the right thing and they'll, which they are, and try to order something, the licensee will submit artwork to us, and we'll go, wait a minute, we haven't seen this. Who's ordering it? What's going on? And we'll go back to the department and say, you gotta fill out this form. So we wanna know what, what, what you're doing. We wanna make sure, you know, if you're saying, oh, we're, we're just gonna give away these shirts, okay, but if it's got, you know, athletics marks and you are, I don't know, economics, it doesn't necessarily jive right, and we gotta make sure everyone's kind of <coughs> 
just to clarify that, the, the trademark licensing, the branded artwork review, looks at both to make sure that you're using a licensed vendor, but also that the visual identity is applied correctly. So there's a little bit of a two-part um, reason for that process. Are, are there any <coughs> vendors in, in the procurement <coughs> system that can sell you a shirt what's not licensed through your office? Are there loopholes in that? That's a, great, that's a great question. So we frequently get asked, oh, are university vendors and licensees the same thing? And the answer to that is no. So Office Depot is a university vendor. They are not a licensee. So they themselves cannot produce a branded mug or a shirt or any item with any of our marks on it. Just keep in mind, though, that this uh, licensee does not apply to printed material. So letterhead, posters, brochures, things like that, that's, that's a different category. We're specifically talking about products, items, merchandise for this policy. Hey, can, I, can I add on to that? If, uh, if, if somebody put through a purchase order and was less than $10,000, where they could really do whatever they wanted, you guys would really never know. And who's going to give out $10,000 worth of shirts? That's a lot of money. So basically, how many do you actually grab? If people here can do whatever they want under 10000 how would that ever get caught? Sure, absolutely. So we are continuing to work through the process of kind of uh, labeling those avenues of why and how we can uh, review those items. Um, purchasing, yes, with P cards and certain things, um, we may not know. But to be fair, um, anybody who's reproducing our marks that is a trademark, um, especially if it's a registered trademark, it's a federal offense if you do that. So those companies don't normally will take that chance. Some smaller companies might say, hey, Joe, they might do that for a small order, but quite frequently they won't because they know that I think like that, that, that could wipe you out. Um, well, and also not to mention we're here educating all of you, yeah. right? So now you know not to use your P card and don't go to those vendors to buy your shirts. Also, a lot of the merchandise we're talking about is sort of custom artwork or custom design. Most of the time, vendors will want a purchase order before they start working for you <coughs> and doing these designs. They're not just going to spend the time doing graphics work for you without a promise of an order. So even though they're under $10,000, most of the time, there's still usually a purchase order involved. And we work very closely with procurement. But fairly, it goes back both ways. We also, yeah, it might, you might say, oh, I can save money, I can do this. And then you get a product and, oh, it falls apart, or the R is wrong, and now I spent only spent $4,000 or whatever, but my product looks terrible, and I don't even want to give this out, because now everyone goes, where did you get that from? Oh, that's that department. So it kind of balances both ways. We want to make sure everybody's got the right thing, and they're doing it the right way. So by spending time and making sure it was licensed, we can make sure that they have the right arm. All right, so what do you need to know? Um, Obviously, pretty much everything I kind of said is funneled through the form. Um, for departments, the branded merchandise armor for you form um, will kind of guide you through. They'll ask you questions. Who's your licensee that you're using? So then you'll know, oh, i got to use a licensee. What are you using uh, the marks for? Oh, it's a product I'm giving away. Um, as you fill it out, our contact information is on that page. The University Policies uh, for Trademark Licensing is there as well. But you can always ask us, oh, I don't know how to submit the artwork. Oh, okay. And, and we can kind of help walk you through the process. We frequently have conversations with different departments in different areas on how to kind of get the artwork uh, uploaded, make sure that everything is uh, there for us to, to see. I want to just chime in. When you are placing your order, or at least talking to the vendor, the vendor should supply you with a proof of how the product is going to look with the marks on the product. And that, usually it's a PDF, some depending on the vendor, um, that proof should be attached to the form. If you send, a lot of people will just send a water bottle. It, it will not be approved without seeing that artwork exactly the way it's going to look on, on the young product. So the visual identity manual is also there, a link to it. Um, and this way you can kind of see how the signatures uh, are used, how logo types. Your area may have requirements that might be a little bit more stringent than what our requirements are. Um, but we're always happy to have a conversation part of the development of the merchandise, merchandise artwork review form. But so we can see what artwork you're doing. And this way, if there's something wrong with it, we can fix it at the beginning 
and not at the end. Um, too often we get stuff at the 11th hour, departments want something in three days, and if we haven't seen it, things need to be changed, it might be too late. So obviously send it sooner than later so we can kind of review it, get back to you, and make sure you want to. <coughs> Um, before I get into advertising, I just wanted to say that um, it's not just about marks, but the actual Rucker's name, the word, is also a trademark. So even if you're using a t-shirt with just the word Rucker's on it and some generic font, that also applies. It's not just the block R, the logo type of the shield, uh, and also, because you see it all over the place, you know, I think Rucker's football over here just has, maybe not, but I'm sure there's... We've all seen the t-shirts that just say Rutgers and black text. That's also a trademarked uh, item. So external advertising policy. Um, this is the policy that governs how advertising is managed and reviewed at the university. Um, basically, all paid uh, promotion of Rutgers. Sponsored content, tradi traditional advertising, the uh, advertisement in a conference brochure, a billboard, a TV, a radio, whatever, all has to go through advertising. <coughs> this is a similar process to the branded artwork merchandise review form, blah, that's, a, that's a long name, but, um, and why do we do this? We do this to make sure, A, the logos are present and they're represented, but this, the advertising policy also, and so does the trademark licensing policy, have some guidelines about where the marks can be used. So I'm going to give you an example. We're going to walk down a scenario. Um, how many people in here are parents? How many people on occasion like to have a beer or a glass of wine or a cocktail? OK, so a large cross section, right? Somebody with a marketing hat like myself might say, hmm, my audience likes to enjoy a cocktail. Perhaps I should uh, as do an advertisement for prospective parents and food and wine or some sort of alcohol-related um, magazines. Not that far of a stretch, right? You can see how people might get there. One of the things in the policy is that the Rutgers brand and our marks cannot be affiliated with alcohol, alcohol drugs, uh, any sort of weapons, things like that. So, you know, that's a little bit of a fun example about how somebody could get there without any ill intent. And those are the kind of things that we look for. We look for to make sure the marks are right. We look um, to make sure that two departments aren't, you know, putting billboards right next to each other on the New Jersey Turnpike, um, you know, things like that. But we also look for content and placement and things like that. Um, and all the ad review metrics ladder up to the president. You know, this is something that he wants to see where the brand is represented, how money is being spent. So this is something that we do report up to the, the top level of the university. Um, this uh, communication.records.edu is a website we're going to show you. And all these policies that we're talking about today and the forms and related forms are found on that website. So again, but this is not just <coughs> traditional print and TV advertising. In the world of social media, the sponsored content, that sponsored sort of uh, boosting of messages, those things are all considered advertisements on behalf of the university as well. Um, I think that I already covered all this. Um, I will say back to the um, question about, you know, a lot of ads, hold on one second, um, cost less than the, pur the purchase order threshold, a couple things. Purchasing is very aware of this policy. They will not approve any PO or any requisition for advertising without our approval. And also, um, the sole source bid letter. A lot of times if you're placing an ad in the Wall Street Journal, well, there's only one Wall Street Journal. How do you prove that you've gotten multiple bids? That sole source or bid waiver letter comes from ad review as well. So there's a few incentives for people to use this. A, first of all, it won't get through. And B, we do provide that bid waiver letter. Um, does that also apply to the block R? The, the yes. alcohol and the um, advertisement? It does. It does. Um, there are some. Uh, IMG is our um, sponsor or manager for athletics. So I know there are some agreements in terms of, uh, you know, alcoholic beverages sold at the stadium and things like that. Um, those that were specifically uh, negotiated. The only reason why I ask, there's a truck that goes to 287 every single morning. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point, I haven't seen it lately because I'm on a different schedule, 
It's got a huge block R on the back of it, but it's a beer distributor. What is it, a truck? A truck. A truck. A so delivery. that's possible that it's a local distributor who has Rutgers Pride that might ha be using the marks um, you know, incorrectly. We, I will tell you um, that although Greg talked about our trademark licensing policy and our infringement and uh, cease and desist, we do tend to have a little bit of a softer touch with sort of local community businesses. I, I'll give you an example. You, I drive through Highland Park every day. There's a uh, Rutgers barber shop and there's Rutgers painting and things like that. You know, we're not out to like get mom and pop. So I, I can't speak to the exact example that you're talking about, but it could be Joe's distribution based in New Brunswick who's run by an alumni that perhaps we've sort of given a pass that does happen more to um, help with community goodwill and, and again it's not it's not a major infringement issue so so that could be the case there does that make sense yeah so that's why you'll see the barbershop the painting you know we're, we're not out to like you know with pitchforks and bonfires to like you know go go get those small mom and pop that's not really the intention it's more the broader brand integrity they're not hurting anything. Um, okay, I don't think I have anything else on this. Any other questions about ad review or, or that kind of stuff? Endorsements and con sponsorship policy. This is a big one, um, and it's kind of got two parts, so I'm going to break it up. I'm going to talk about endor endorsements first. Um, I would say that probably many people in this room work with outside vendors or, or things like that, outside partners for whatever. Rutgers as a public state university can not and is forbidden by policy to endorse any product, service, business, person, etc. An endorsement is different than a statement of fact. An endorsement is a subjective statement. Something that says they're fabulous, they're fun, they do great work. Those things are endorsement statements. You can absolutely say, we worked with so-and-so, they did this project for us, uh, they met their project goals, um, they came in on time. Those types of things are statements of fact and are allowed. However, you cannot say they're awesome. We'd, we'd recommend them. So this is a, a tricky slope. People in marketing are always asked, please put your case study on my website. We see it all the time. We sign some big deal with a, with a software company and they want in the contract a press release, a case study of this or that. You know, again, we can do certain things as long as it's on that statement of fact line, but not that endorsement line. Given, given how we're funded and who we are in our position in the state, we really just can't do it. Um, so that's the endorsement side of the policy. Now I'm going to move over to the sponsorship policy. Sponsorships certainly um, happen all over the <coughs> university, and, and we, you know, encourage folks to do it. There are some guidelines. First of all, if you have a sponsor, let's say you're running an event or some sort of initiative and you want to partner with some outside firms, either just because it's a like-minded program or because you're asking them for money. A couple things. First of all, sponsors must be clearly marked as such. It must be labeled in partnership with or sponsored by so that that relationship is clearly marked. And no sponsor logo or mention or advertisement can appear on anything that students need to get their education or to, um, to do their coursework. So I'll give you an example. The bus. There's ads all over the bus. Although many, many students use the bus, they don't have to use the bus. Nowhere in any syllabus does it say you must ride the bus to class. The rec centers. Many sponsors, many outside partner logos. You don't have to go to the rec center. You don't have to go to the student center. So those are areas where sponsorship logos are allowed. Classrooms, no. Financial aid systems where you have to pay your bill, no. Um, uh, labs or things where coursework is happening. Learning management systems, no. You know, anything that is integrated and must be used by the students for their education, sponsorships are not allowed. And also, any sort of sponsorship agreement that uses the Rutgers name or any of our trademarks has to go through trademark licensing for review because we need to see what sort of permission we're granting folks with, our, with those trade names. You know, we just usually make sure that we're not granting 
them the ability to put it all over their buildings or, or things like that, or we're not and, you know, then encroaching into, into endorsement territory. But any of those, we work very closely with the contracts team and procurement, we work very closely with the Office of the General Counsel. But those are the, you know, if you're wondering what those policies are about, those are the 10,000 foot views of sort of the do's and don'ts. I'm going to skip through this. I think we've already talked this. I tend to not really use my slides very much. Uh, visual identity policy. I'm going to turn this over to Elise. She's our visual, visual identity expert. Okay, this would be a good time for everybody to get some cookies to stay awake. And if I fall into that hole, don't laugh too hard. Um, so what is the visual identity policy? So the Board of Governors mandate that everybody use this new visual identity that was approved back in 2006. And this means that everybody throughout the university is supposed to support it. And the visual identity is made up of several different marks that we will be going through. Um, but the, at the very least, if you don't know what to use, you should use the Rutgers logo type, which you'll see in, in a minute. Um, this helps build a strong equity in the Rutgers brand, and it's a clear and consistent identity which helps unify the university. So, you know, the brand is very important. As Rebecca said, it's got a lot of value to it, and you know, everybody is supposed to support it. Okay, now I have to. Um, the, the mandate also stated that if you have a logo, you have to retire it. If you want to make a logo in the future, you can't. So what we consider a logo is text and a graphic element together attached to one another. If you can use text by itself or a graphic element by itself, as long as there's nothing near it or around it, if it's someplace else, if you're doing a bag and you have a graphic element, you can put it on one side of the bag and then put the Rutgers identity on the other side of the bag. That's, um, or even on print material, <coughs> you can use, people have used graphic um, elements in <coughs> creative ways. Um, the, so the, the, the system consists of logo type signatures, the shield, and you'll see that in a minute. The Rutgers Visual Identity Manual can be found at the communications.rutgers.edu uh, website. And the, um, if you want a more extensive class, the class is three hours, you can take the Communicator Certificate Program. And we really um, get more into a lot of the different marks and how they are used and when you can use them. Um, it's a three hour class, so it's a little more expensive and we don't serve people. <laughs> so, so it's an hour and a half here, and we got pizza to boot. So back in 2005, my department at the time was tasked with um, finding all the different graphics and logos that were across the university. These are just a handful. There were over 300 logos. Some of these actually my department made. Some of them say Rutgers. Some of them don't. But this was a problem because the, uh, we took a survey and people did not really identify with Rutgers. There was nothing combining us. So then this is when the Board of Governors signed the resolution to um, approve the Rutgers visual identity. So the visual identity consists of the Rutgers logo type at the top. When a lot of times I talk to people and I mention the logo type, or I mention the signature, I mention this, they don't know what I'm talking about. So this is a little explanation. So the Rutgers at the top is considered the logo type. This is, if you don't know what to use, this is the mark to use. Then when you see the Rutgers with text underneath it, it's called the signature. And there's different ways we lay out the signature depending on for embroidery, we have to beef up the signature a little bit, so we change it a little bit. So that's something that my department would do. Um, the University of Camden, the, the Chancellor level signatures, they're all caps. Um, so these are just some examples. You have Rutgers Health, and then you have the Shield, which is um, the relatively new mark that's a couple of years old, and the Seal, 
that a lot of people were using is, also, is retired, so you can't use that anymore. I know a lot of people still have it on their website, and as people um, start redoing their websites, we've been asking them to remove the seal, because a lot of people use it as a watermark. <coughs> Why has it been? I'm sorry? Why has it been um, removed? Is there a particular reason? Um, President Clarkson wanted it removed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of people liked it when we developed this this shield. He asked that it be retired. So if you have a problem. <laughs> let me know what he says. <laughs> yep. You guys regulate a review, like if the department wants to um, have a, a name for themselves and put it on the wall with a logo. Right, Does so that have to go you? Yes, yeah, so anytime, you, so first of all, these marks are only made by my department. So just because you want a signature doesn't mean you necessarily can have one. So um, academic departments don't get signatures, but centers and institutes do. Some schools mandate that you can't have a signature. So, um, you know, all marks are made by my department. We go through a process where we will contact somebody higher up in, in the department or the school to get approval to make the signature, and then we make a bunch of different files. Um, the files include desktop letterhead, PowerPoint templates, so it's a whole complete package with all different kind of files for you to use. But in your case, if you want to put it on the wall, yes, you would have to check with us to make sure that it's used correctly. Because a lot of times people change the font um, on the bottom, or, or the vendor might make their, the mark themselves, and it, a lot of people don't recognize whether the signature is right or not, but we always well, Let me just interject here. Our division has three official signatures which this department created for us, which Elise created for us. Public safety has their own, facilities has their own, and then we have institutional planning and operations. I have the files that you need for your specific signature. So most of you know that because most of you come to me for the signature. If you haven't in the past, come to me for that. I have it. There's no reason to ask University Communications to create one for you. We have the official signatures. They already created them. But, but sometimes we have clients that they, they have, you know, created a new space and they have a new name for it that they want and they want to put the logo with it and, and they want to put it on the wall. Yeah. So you know what I mean? check with facilities and Deb Rubinsky at facilities. Oh, oh you're, okay. I never met you. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, they come up to you and just like, oh, I'm so and so. I email people all the time, but I don't, have, I don't see faces. Um, so anyway, yeah. So Deb and I work closely together. So if there's any issues with putting the name on buildings or on walls, I usually refer the people to Deb. Okay. So this is an overview of what the system looks like. I explained the um, logo type and the signature. There's also the, the shield. Um, the spirit mark, the block R, the athletic marks, the university flag, which is only flown at university buildings, so you can't go out and purchase a flag for your house. Um, the fonts that we use are Fermata and Giovanni. These are not mandatory fonts. You can use any font you want for your print material or putting on your, your merchandise. You don't have to use these fonts. Um, the, color for the university, the main color is Pantone 186, red, and the full name of the university, everybody knows. The only thing that a lot of people don't know is that the the in Buckers the State University of New Jersey is always capitalized. A lot of people will put a lowercase t for the the the, the, the. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. And then there's Buckers Health. Buckers Health is going to be working on their their brand, um, it's not going to be ready for quite a while. Uh, you could get this like that for a center? You can. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> you can, maybe. <laughs> it depends if it will be approved. It okay. Depends. Usually a research center. You would contact me okay. um, and request. What's the center? Center for Cognitive Science. Mm -hmm. I think you have one. We have our own logo. That's a little... The 
Okay. It's a little questionable. Right. But I'm just thinking even just to have something that says just records and that that would right. be really valuable. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's only a lot of events. It's a little crowded. You're not an SAS, are you? We're an SAS. Okay, so you know you can't. That's what I would do. Right. You're one of the SAS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, as I mentioned before, some schools don't allow signatures, and SAS is a school that doesn't allow signatures. So, there you go. That was the yes, maybe answer. Hold on, though. Before, before we go into this, I want to talk about that a bit. People think, oh my God, I have to have a signature. No one's going to know who I am if we don't. So let's keep in mind that the signature portion and the shield portion are both optional elements. You absolutely can have a website with the Rutgers logotype, School of Arts and Sciences signature, and then very big next to it, you can have a headline saying, my center name here, right? On your brochure, on your website banner, on your poster. So the signature is not the be all and end all. It is an optional treatment that we have provided through the visual identity, so at least there's some cohesion. If people want to um, link their school center department names with the lower type, but even on, uh, we're, I don't know if we have it in this presentation, there's, uh, if you look at Rutgers.edu, very first thing is you see Rutgers Shield, the logo type, but we don't use the signature. We have the state university nice and big next to it. Much more readable, much more easier for the, for the visitor to use. So, so let's keep in mind that that signature treatment is an optional element, but there's many, many other ways to brand or market your <coughs> initiative center program. With that being said, um, so a lot of people wanted to use the block R and, and you know, in the beginning, we were very strict with using it, and then we kind of started expanding it a little bit where we put um, text underneath. So you can have a block R with like environmental sciences, we have R law, we have R recreation. I think we did, did we do an R IPO? I thought no, we were going to, but I don't know, we might not have. Um, we are also doing acronyms now. So um, we've expanded it even more, but this is for Spirit merchandise only. So if you want to wear um, a block R to go, you know, out to dinner or whatever, and you want the R with text underneath, the, my tra the trademark office, you can send a request, we'll review it, and if it's okay, we'll make the, the marks as well. These marks are not handed out to departments like the signatures are because we've had issues where we've made the marks for um, a school that won't be mentioned. Um, and they started putting it on everything. So you can't put this on business cards. You can't put it on flyers. You can't put it on official university business, like letterhead, and they were doing that. So we kind of had to rein it in a little bit. So we only give the marks to the licensed vendor who you're using to, to put it on, the, um, on whatever product that you're, you know, want to put it on. But again, these marks, they're made in different colors. The R can be in certain colors. The, um, the logo type, there's certain restrictions when you use these marks that they can only be in certain colors. The R, you can't put stuff inside of it. You can't make it black, you know, that kind of thing. Any questions about the R with text underneath? Oh. So when we were talking about logos, so when we were talking about logos, there's a creative way where you can use a graphic element with, um, without creating a logo. So Honors College uses this diamond motif, um, the SAS that have used the gate in their, um, in their material. So these are examples here of how you can use a graphic element without creating a logo and it works very effectively. The only time you can create a logo is if you're having an anniversary mark, uh, an anniversary, you can create a logo for the anniversary. It has to be approved by the trademark office, and you can use the anniversary mark for one year. So it's either the academic year, the calendar year, or the year of the anniversary. So that's one exception. Any question about print collateral? 
So this is what, we're, what Rebecca was talking about. I'm going to fall in that part. Um, where you, these are acceptable web banners that you can use. The, so the requirements for web is that the Rutgers logo type appears at the top left on all your web pages, that there's a link back to the home page, the Rutgers home page, and that you have the right copyright information <coughs> at the bottom. But here's an example of Rutgers Mason Gross where they can use their signature like the business school. You can see the business school, it's very small, it's very hard to read, but Mason Gross, it's much bigger, so it's, it's much easier to read. So this is an example of how using it on a web banner, it's better if you don't use a signature. Turn it back to Rebecca. Sure. So um, this is the website that I mentioned before, UCM. Well, we used to have, I don't know, three or four or five websites sort of all spread around. And uh, it was hard for people to use, right? It wasn't, it wasn't geared toward the user. So we switched this, I think, last summer or sometime. And <coughs> communication.rutgers.edu has what you've heard today and more. So I know you're all hoping for some light reading when you get back to your desk and are all going to go visit this and read the policies in depth. But this is where you'll find some details about more uses for the visual identity, the manuals in here. There's also several, I want to change my screen black like I did before, which is what this button does. Well, there we go. Under this, we talked today about the policies, you know, the must-have, must-follow parts of what UCM um, manages for university. But we also have this resources area that has some things that folks can use or guidelines, social media guideline, um, a photo gallery that's available. Uh, that is more sort of helpful things that we've produced because we've heard from folks if there's need. So take a look at that resources area and you might find something useful. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you guys are a captive audience, so you get the enjoyment of hearing about the new ACE program. Did anyone go to the uh, road shows? I see a few hands. Okay, great. So what this is, is if you, your department, your team, anyone has a need for a communication and marketing or graphic design or a photographer or whatever, um, and, and your internal team just there's only however many of them. They don't have the bandwidth. Uh, we see this at UCM all the time. What we have done is work with procurement to put together a master service agreement program for firms that do work in these categories. So we have identified these 10 areas through a survey, through work with many folks across the university. And what we have done is contracted these folks all up front so that it takes the paperwork and also the brand training off the, off the shoulders of the folks who need to use the services. So I, I'm sure many people in this room have tried to hire a vendor or have hired a vendor or hire them regularly. And for professional services, I'm speaking about. You need a W-9, you need insurance, you need an ICE form, you need a contract, you need all these things. The first time I tried to do it, I was like, wait, what? Like, what do you mean? I just want a freelancer to do a little work for me and I need 47 documents. I was like, there must be a better way. Not to mention the fact that UCM gets asked all the time, do you have a recommendation for a videography? Who can I use for brochure development? All the time. So not only was this information not available to the public, it was really hard once you did identify who you wanted to use. So I'm going to skip this, but there's a video that's on our website that's about two minutes long. It's a little bit of a narrative on how you might use it. And what I want to talk about here quickly is that these vendors are all on this website for you to go in, not only to see what they're contracted for and what their pre-negotiated rates are, but also, the best kept secret at Rutgers was always, well, who's used these folks in the past? You know, I'm interested in using this firm, and I never knew that my partner down the hall had already used them, or the folks upstairs, or the folks downstairs. What this program is also doing is tracking who else at Rutgers is using them, and listing those folks as a point of contact. So you're getting ready to do some sort of event planning, at that example. You want to do a new website, although I know that you're not because you already did. But let's use that as an example. I'm interested in hiring firm A. Well, they, they tell me they do good work. Their website looks good. I'm going to go ahead and sign uh, a, a purchase order for hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
But only if I had known the department downstairs had used them two years ago and they did an awful job. Now, with this firm, with this tool, you will be able to tell. We're already filling in those points of contact at Rutgers um, who have used these vendors. And, and maybe they did a fabulous job, and that's great information to know. But maybe they went over budget, or they didn't deliver, or they were slow, or they screwed <coughs> up the logo, or whatever. <coughs> that information is now contained in this ACE supplier list, and you all have access to it. And not to mention, every single vendor who's included in this program has been trained similar to what you all received today. So they know about the visual identity, they know about the sponsorship, <coughs> policy, ad review, all that stuff. Um, so that is the ACE program. I encourage you to check it out, watch our cute video. Thanks to Liv's team for, for uh, recommending the video scribe tool. We used it, it's really fun. Um, and then anyone who has any interest in what you got, what we heard today, branding, um, marketing, anything like that, should we're encouraging you all to join the Communicators Network. This is a network that of about 370 folks across the university, and it, it does a couple of things. It shares ideas, resources, and um, recommendations, but it also, you know, what tool did you use to make a communications plan? But it also shares events that are happening. That's how the roadshows were published. Um, the Communicators Network has events twice a year where we have experts come in and speak, um, and things like that. So if you have any interest in that, email the contact us, uh, email here or me, and we'll be happy to add you. And that's what we've got. I don't know if there's any follow-up questions, any other comments? Did everybody sign this sign-in sheet? No. 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 Okay. Do we know where the sign-in sheet is? Anywhere. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, we're happy to have you, and enjoy.